Well, I do bring you greetings uh, from your brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who speak the gospel with a Wesleyan accent. Uh, that's how we speak the gospel. I just returned. This was wonderful to be able to, uh, to pray with and hear your story, Vladimir. I just returned from Europe on Monday. We gathered Christians from Ukraine, Ro Rom Romania, Moldova, Moldova, Macedonia, and Hungary. Uh, all together. And I will say that um, I have sung the Raise the Hallelujah, that I love that song, in the presence of my enemies. But it's hard to, it's humbling when you sing that song surrounded by people who truly are raising their hallelujahs literally in the presence of their enemies. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, Vladimir and, and the way that we've been able to pray. But what I did witness while I was there uh, was that the Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving. Even though war rages and suffering is, in fact, everywhere, the Holy Spirit is still moving with power. Still moving with power for protection, for comfort, and for transformation. And that is good news. Can I get an amen? Because that is good news. Nothing stops the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want you to, to do something for me while we get, when we get started. I want you to take out your phone, because I know you all have one. Uh, and I want you to go to this website, thenicestplace.net. Just real quick. Anybody there yet? Go there real quick and look at it just for a minute. Anybody seeing it? I see some people are smiling. You got it? There's something really neat about this site. There's something really, really neat uh, about this site. Uh, when I first visit, it's really simple. I mean, it's a real simple concept, and when I first visited, it made me smile, just like I saw some folks in the middle there. I saw you smile, and when you saw it, it made me smile, and it made me happy, so I sent the link to my kids. I send texts to my kids each morning, and I sent them the link to this site and said, a hug, here's a hug to start your day. But even in the midst of that kind of nice feeling that I got from being at this site, I realize that this site is actually pointing to something deeper, something more profound, actually something a little sad, a little sad, that the world is filled with so many lonely and disconnected people that a website offering virtual hugs would become a thing. A website offering virtual hugs would become a thing, that people are so hungry for connection that a website offering virtual hugs would become a thing when here we are sitting in this room with the gospel of Jesus Christ, something that offers the most profound and powerful connection possible. So how did we get here? How did we get here? How is it that instead of seeing the light and the hope of the resurrection, Instead of seeing the Holy, Holy Spirit transformation, instead of witnessing people who follow the one who healed the sick and hung out with the at, outcasts and the lonely, instead of seeing people like that, David's research indicates that they're not seeing people like that. They're seeing a graceless, joyless witness a witness that's sometimes seized by fear and is hypocritical and filled with grievances. That's frequently what they've seen. That's why we end up with cynical young people who don't trust that we really believe what we say or that, that we're willing to live out what we say that we believe. And so I, I believe that part of the problem that we've got uh, has to do with the way that we carry ourselves in the world, our posture, our posture. Uh, we may have experienced the love of Christ and the transformation of the Holy Spirit. The question is, can anybody else see that that is how we carry ourselves? Can they see it just by looking at us? Can they see it? Now, our posture is is crucial 
Because as Lisa Bevere has said, the greatest platform you will ever live on is your own life. The greatest platform, we may be all over social media, but the greatest platform we will ever live on is our own lives. So if we don't become better at connecting what we say with how we live, you know, if we don't become better at living out a posture that conveys the love of God through Jesus Christ, we're never going to be able to reach our world. And our world desperately needs the healing, transformative, saving love of Jesus Christ. Now, we all know that uh, showing and sharing the love of Jesus is, is always a process. Uh, and we've got to be willing to walk with people for a long, long time. And sometimes uh, it's, it's a very, very long time as they explore and as they experience faith. Now, <laughs> I know I'm supposed to be providing you strategies, and you may, be, you may ultimately be disappointed. <laughs> because I think where we are at this moment in time is not necessarily about strategies. It's not about programs. It's not about trying to reinvent the way we did things before. And, and I was really pleased, David, with what all you, you talked about. What we need now is simply real people living out the gospel in real ways that are visible and engaging in ordinary human behavior like conversation and listening. So that's the kind of strategies you're going to hear from me today. Re get back to normal human behavior. Normal human behavior where people engage with each other and ask questions and grow together where no one has all the answers but we're willing to walk with people while they try to find the answers. So I found that a, a metaphor that I think can help us with this whole process. And it's the metaphor of embrace. And I think it's helpful because it points to the nature of God, which I think is really important, and the way that, the, that God reaches out to us. And that, in turn, helps us envision how we reach out to others. Because we ought to be reaching out to others in the same way that God reaches out to us. So if you think about an embrace, if you're thinking about an embrace, it has four stages. You probably have never broken it down like this, but an embrace has four stages, and each one flows from the other, okay? We have to open our arms, and then we have to wait. You may not realize that you have to wait, but you have to wait, and then you close your arms, and then you open them again. And without all four of those stages, you don't have an embrace. It's incomplete. So we can't simply open our arms and wait, or nothing will ever happen. Uh, but if we open our arms, wait, and then close them again, and then don't open them back up, we've not actually embraced another person. We've overpowered them. So you need all four of those steps. All four. And each one of those steps helps us visualize the way that God reaches out to us and then the way that we reach out to others. And again, I'm talking individual Christ followers reaching the world. I'm not talking about a programmatic thrust of the church. I'm not even talking about a paid youth pastor doing this. I'm talking about every single Christ follower doing this. So the first stage is opening our arms. From the very beginning and continuing on through Jesus, God opens God's arms to us, right? Making space within God's very self for us. Making space within God's very self for us. And this openness comes before anything and everything else. Before we're even aware of it, God is already loving us. Before we're even aware of it, God is already loving us, offering his grace through Jesus Christ, and then inviting us to respond in faith and love. So we model 
that space making when we open our arms to others. Now, open arms is almost a universally understood sign of welcoming. Almost everywhere you go, if someone opens their arms, you get a sense uh, of welcoming. It's a visible way that people can see that we have made space for them. And when we open our arms, when we open our arms, it's a sign um, of that we are humble. It's a humble kind of openness that we've done because we're making ourselves vulnerable. This is a, this is a pretty vulnerable posture. You know, you can come at me if you really want to. It's a vulnerable posture. We, we're taking a risk. We're taking a risk, and that's key. Because so many people uh, in our churches expect other people to take the risk. <laughs> they expect other people to take the risk. And we've, we've got gazillions of really, really friendly churches. They're really friendly, and they're willing to open the, their arms to others every single Sunday. Those others just have to visit the church first, <laughs> and then they'll open their arms. But you're taking a huge risk when you visit a church these days. You're, you're, even, even as a Christian, it's a huge risk to visit uh, a new church. But the open arms of embrace help us with the idea that we are the ones that have to take the risk. Just as God opened God's arms to us while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, we open our arms to others before they visit, before they visit, before they get their lives in order, before anything and everything else. So this means that we have to actually engage people outside of the church and outside of our buildings outside of Sunday mornings. We have to open ourselves up to the possibility of new friendships, getting, risk getting to know our neighbors, for goodness sakes. Our neighbors. We're a, we're a uh, backyard culture in the United States. We used to be a front porch culture in the United States, but now we're not. We're, we're, we're a back porch culture. But think about the turquoise table movement. Anyone aware of the turquoise table movement? A great, a great, wonderful idea. Set up a, a picnic table in your front yard and serve food and, and welcome anybody that wants to come by. Invite your neighbors. Make it a place uh, of welcoming and of community. Or Alpha. Alpha is all about leaving the church building and, and having people in your homes and, and walking on a journey together, asking questions, opening yourselves to others that would never dream of setting foot uh, in a church. That's as close, those two things are as close to a program as you're going to get uh, from me. <laughs> but there's, there's nothing new about any of this. But for some reason, we're still in the mindset that we need a program. It has to be a group effort all together at the same time, and it's got to be led by the pastor. And that's not, that's not what we're talking about. All we're talking about is building relationships. Real relationships. Relationships that you, want, you would want to have yourself with other people. Now, I'm not saying that this is easy. It's absolutely not easy because our world is filled with barriers and boundaries. But open arms... Open arms show people that even though we know that there are barriers and boundaries that keep people apart, we would rather cross them than maintain them. That's what open arms are telling the world. And here's the most important part about that uh, first stage, that open arms. Just as God opens his arms to us and we then open our arms to others, that is part of our work as messengers of reconciliation and ambassadors for Christ. It's one of the first ways that we are going to help others become aware of God's grace for all people. And it's it, they're the, one of the first ways that they're going to become aware of God's continuing desire to be in a relationship of wholeness with all of humanity, with all of creation for that matter. 
And that awareness in someone else, that's, that is a major, major step in establishing a relationship with God. People have to recognize that God is waiting for them. They have to recognize that. They have to see that in us. There's a young pastor in my town who's leading a, a, a church, and they see themselves as a witness for, for Christ in their neighborhood. Um, they're not trying to become a big church. Uh, they're not trying to draw people from all over town. Uh, I don't even know if they're deliberately thinking about growing in the t traditional church growth sense. They're just committed to showing and sharing the love of Jesus in their community. So each person in that church has a list of two to three families that live either near them or near the church itself. And they've made a commitment to getting to know those people. That's all they're, that's, that's all they're doing. They've made a commitment to actually getting to know those people. Now, that's not the same thing as inviting them to church, necessarily. They may, that may happen eventually. Who knows? But what they're doing right now is simply getting to know them, opening themselves to becoming friends, being good neighbors who care about the well-being of the people around them. So we open our arms to others just as God has opened God's arms to us. Now, I want to stop for a minute. And I want you to, to give you some questions, not to talk about now, but to, th to think about and maybe, maybe start conversations uh, with others on the break if you want to take a picture of them or whatever. But I want you to think about how you have experienced God's open arms in your own life. How has that been for you? Is that a source of joy for you? I would hope so. If it is, how come you're not showing it in the way that you live and the way that you engage other people? Are you carrying yourself as someone who knows that they have been saved by the blood of the Lamb? Are you carrying yourself as someone that's reflecting the light of the resurrection in your life? Now, when you think about that, think also about whether or not there was a person that God used to bring you closer to him. If there was, bring that, bring that person to your mind. Or maybe write down that person's name. What was it about that person that enabled them to be a channel of God's love for you? What was it about that person that enabled them to be a channel of God's love for you? So think about, think about that. Well, we open our arms to others just as God has opened God's arms to us. And then we wait. We wait. That's the second stage. And it's pretty difficult. We don't like to wait. <laughs> we want everything to happen all at once. But it's really, really important. It's really important. God created us to be in relationships of love and harmony with God and with other people. But you can see, all you have to do is look around and you can see that those relationships are broken. All those relationships are broken again. And that brokenness is a huge sign of how deeply rooted sin really is within us and within, within our world. So we need, we need the healing grace of God to put things right. We need the healing grace of God to return us and our world into the wholeness that God had, has intended for us from the very beginning. We need God's healing grace, but we don't always realize it uh, or accept it. So God waits. God waits. God is infinitely patient and will never force us or manipulate us. So God waits. God opens God's arms and waits. And then the Holy Spirit moves within us enabling us to recognize our need and enabling us to freely respond to God's grace. And when we do, when we do, we're able to open our own arms in repentance and experience God's divine embrace. And that is what we are reflecting to other people. That is exactly what we're reflecting to other people through our own 
waiting. We reach for others, but we don't yet touch. You know, rather than forcing a response, we create space and wait for the response from the other person, a reciprocal opening of their arms, right? And, but waiting is probably the hardest part of embrace, but it's an exercise of self-control within ourselves for the sake of the integrity of the other person. It's also crucial because it creates space for the working of the Holy Spirit and the opportunity for discernment. It's focused time. It's prayerful time when we are joining in God's movement in the world. It gives us the opportunity to become more aware of what, the other per what is going on in the other person, what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of them and between us and the other person. And it enables us to gain wisdom about how we need to help others open their own arms to God. And it's, as David said, it's, it's, there's, this is not cookie-cutter thing. We're, n we're not making uh, mass-producing Christians. We're handcrafting them. I think that's what you said. We're handcrafting them. So we need to be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit, giving us discernment about what the person might need in, the, in, in this ongoing conversation and relationship that we're developing. Because we're journeying with other people. That is what we're doing. We're journeying with other people and our willingness to wait patiently and non-judgmentally creates an environment where the Holy Spirit can move and people can discover the reality of sin in their own lives and sense their profound need for God. They may not think of themselves as spiritual, obviously. We do, they don't. <laughs> but eventually they will. Eventually, they will have a name for it, even if they don't have a name for it now. And our waiting, though, it's not passive, because we're, we're actively waiting, we're praying, we're listening to what others have to say, and we're asking questions about their experiences and their thoughts. I have a friend that ministers in a, in a very pluralistic environment with lots of unchurched people and nominally Christian people and also a whole lot of Muslims and people uh, of other faiths. And he has these guiding questions that he always uses as he engages in conversation with people. Um, questions like, what do you mean by that? Tell me more about what you just said. I want to learn about what you are thinking and feeling and experiencing. Another one is, how did, how did you come to that conclusion? We want to know what people are thinking. We want to know how they got to where they, they are. Uh, and and a, a, a third one is, have you, have you considered X, Y, and Z? Have you considered? Now, he doesn't necessarily ask all these questions all at one time <laughs> in the same conversation. In fact, usually these conversations extend, you know, over long periods of time. And that last question in particular, that gives him a chance to talk about his own experience of faith. I've heard you. I've received from you, and now I, I'm responding. The, th the, third, the third stage of embrace is, is closing our arms. And this is the essence of embrace. Uh, there's a sense of completeness when our arms close in an embrace. And this sense of completeness reflects the integrity that is a foundation for showing and sharing the love of Jesus. Integrity is about wholeness. It's about making the gospel known through the wholeness of our lives. We share through our words. We share through our deeds, and we hope that those things are in sync. And we share through the visible signs that the Holy Spirit makes, makes visible in our, in our midst. And if we think about the metaphor... Closing our arms helps us envision the work of the Holy Spirit. Once again, when the Spirit awakens us to our need for God and we recognize the unmerited love and grace that God offers, the space between us and God becomes secure enough for us to respond in trust by opening our own arms to God. God embraces us, offers forgiveness, acceptance, and salvation, and restores us to right relationship. 
Now, for our part, in repentance, we accept God's offer of grace and forgiveness, and we acknowledge that this gift comes to us through the work of Jesus Christ. And then in the fullness of God's embrace, we're transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and experience the wholeness that God intended for us from the very beginning. Now, just as in the earlier stages, this is what we model for others, but it requires honesty. When we are honest with ourselves and others, when they trust that we believe that we are no worse, no better than they are, the space between us becomes secure enough to lead to the fullness of embrace. We have to be willing to be honest with others about our own struggles, our own questions. When we're honest, it helps people feel more secure about sharing their own struggles and their own questions. It's about being real. And our honesty leads to trust, which leads to security, because people have to trust that we really do love them the way that we say that we love them. And there's enough cynicism out there to, to indicate that they don't right now. So people have to trust that we really do love them the way that we say that we love them. And that trust makes the space feel secure. Closing our arms also involves reciprocity. Reciprocity, it's been said, it, it takes two pairs of arms uh, for one embrace. A full embrace is both active and passive. We, we hold, but we're also held. We don't grip too tightly, but we also don't melt into the other person. That's how we give the Holy Spirit freedom to move, and that's how we give others the freedom to respond. Helping people experience uh, God's forgiveness is a key part of their experience of salvation for sure, but we don't have to help them experience sin. We don't have to worry about that, okay? They may not have a word for it, but everybody experiences sin, and the Holy Spirit is really much better at convicting people of sin uh, than we are, so we don't have to do that. What we are helping people experience is the forgiveness of sin. And the fact that we have been forgiven of our sins ought to bring us not self-righteousness and judgment, but joy and compassion for those who haven't had the opportunity to experience that for themselves. And as we create a sec secure space and are willing to close our arms and embrace, others can experience the reality that through Christ, grace, God's grace is accessible to everybody. The integrity that's envisioned by this reciprocal closing of the arms recognizes that even as we are sharing with others, they also have something to offer us. This, is, this integrity moves us to respect others. Ooh, I'm running out of time. It's respect others so that they feel valued and secure, and it makes space for the Holy Spirit to move through us toward others and between us and then through others toward us. People have to know that we're taking them seriously. Those questions that my friend uses or something like that, they, they can really go a long way in helping people to feel that we are taking them seriously. A while back I was discussing this with a, uh, a minister in, in, my town, in, in my community and they were serving meals to the homeless and, and they felt that this was one of the ways that they could open their arms to their community. And I agree, it's a great way to serve, but then I asked them what they did during the course of the time and they, they basically they served the food and whenever they, they did a devotional and when everyone was done they cleaned up. And I asked, well, it, was there... Was there anyone that just came from the church and sat with the guests just to eat with them and have conversation? No, no job, no serving, no cleaning, just eating and talking. It hadn't occurred to them that that might even be an option. It's crucial that we take people seriously and are open to the possibility that they have something to offer us. Think about that for a minute. It's not just about offering Jesus to others. It's not just about serving selflessly, even though all that's a beautiful thing. It's about being willing to receive something from others as well. It's about recognizing that the Holy Spirit is moving with them in them, even if they don't know it yet, and it's moving in two directions, back and forth, from us to them, from them to us. When people trust us, 
and the space between us is secure enough for a full embrace, that's when we've earned the right to share our own faith experience. Not until then. That is when we uh, have the right to share our own experience. Ooh, I'm over. But here's the deal, okay? We're not telling any people what they should believe. We're telling them what we believe and, more importantly, who we trust. It's not that we waffle on what we believe. We absolutely hold fast to what we believe, but we hold those beliefs lightly and an open hand rather than a clenched fist. And we express those beliefs with compassion and grace. Okay, the last stage is opening our arms. I'm sure you can kind of get the image of that. The Holy Spirit moves. The imprint of the Holy Spirit remains on us. But I'm out of, town, out of time, so I just want, um, I want to leave you with an image. I want to leave you with an image. We'll have to skip these because I want you to see it. There it is. I'm sure you know the, I know, I'm sure you know what story I'm talking about. The image I want you to think about in your mind as you leave this place is the image of a father who had a son who journeyed to a distant land only to lose himself there, only to lose himself there. But when he finally returned to himself, he decided to come home. But while he was still a long way off, that is one of the most important sentences in that whole story. While he was still a long way off, his father was already already on the road, waiting with his arms wide open. Amen. Thank you very much.